Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to tonight's event with Joanne MacArthur. My name is Nandita Bajaj, and I'm thrilled to have everyone here. Uh, I wanted to first start by acknowledging that both Joanne MacArthur and I are calling in from Toronto, which is located on the traditional territory of uh, many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We are thrilled to have drawn audiences from across various social justice movements. And really, the goal of us running events like these is to bridge the gap between our individual movements and also to find overlapping values so that we can have the largest impact on the planet, on the people, as well as the animals. Before we officially get started, I want to acknowledge that this event is being hosted by three organizations, Population Balance, the Fair Start Movement, as well as the Institute for Humane Education. And I am honored to be representing all of them today as I'm affiliated with each of the three organizations. And with that, I'd like to introduce our special guest and a dear friend, Joanne MacArthur. Joanne has been documenting animal stories in over 60 countries for almost two decades. Her latest book, which is also the subject of today's presentation, Hidden, Animals in the Anthropocene, was awarded Photography Book of the Year by Pictures of the Year International. Joanne's work has been published in The Guardian, The Washington Post, National Geographic, Canadian Geographic, Smithsonian Magazine, Feature Shoot, and many others. In 2019, she founded We Animals Media, the world's leading animal photojournalism agency, whose mission is to document the stories of animals in the human environment, those used for food, fashion, entertainment, and experimentation and to connect those stories to the individuals and organizations who can amplify their reach. Over to you, Joanne. Thank you for the warm introduction. Uh, what an honor to be invited to meet with you all and great to see in the chat. Uh, you're coming from all over the place. It's really exciting. Uh, thanks for joining. And as you said, Nandita, uh, I have been photographing for about 20 years in over 60 countries. And, and I'm an animal photojournalist. And so what is that? Well, I will get into it because yes, I'm a photographer, but really at heart, I am a storyteller, which is where we're going to start today. The presentation is called Animals in the Anthropocene. And the Anthropocene is the proposed name for the current geologic epoch. Basically, you know, meaning human planetary domination. Uh, animals have barely anywhere to hide from us now, both wild and domestic. Um, so these are this is this is where we're at historically, and uh, these are the animals caught in the crossfires. But I'll start with a story of rescue, and of hard work, and love, and compassion. Here is this uh, out of focus picture. <laughs> it's uh, a plane that's landed, and the plane is full of chickens. So why is that? Uh, there was a uh, hen farmer on the west coast of the U.S., and he had a change of heart, and he didn't want to be participating in the cruelty inherent in hen farming anymore. And so he called sanctuaries and said, can you take my remaining 3,000 birds, which is a lot of birds. And um, sanctuaries contacted one another, and some could take 10, and some could take 100, some could take 1,000. And so of those 3,000 birds, who, by the way, lived in conditions like this, what you're seeing here is a modern day industrial hen farm. Uh, these are cages packed with five to 10 birds. You can see uh, the cages are stacked very, very high, I think seven or eight cages high. And, uh, and this is what it looks like today. It's a far cry from how it looked even just a couple of decades ago. And so uh, the sanctuaries got together and of the 3000 birds on the West Coast, 1100 were sent to the East Coast in this charter flight. Uh, some anonymous donor paid for this charter flight and we don't know who this person is, but we refer to this person lovingly as the Hennefactor. And so the Hennefactor's plane has landed, there are 1100 birds and people are just really nervous. They don't know how the birds have fared. 
and we go from you know 3,000 birds to 1,100 birds, and now we have 10 birds per crate. And I love this picture because people are just so excited to get their hands on these birds and and let them out at sanctuary. So now we've driven a few hours and we are at farm sanctuary, and these birds are standing on grass for the first time in their lives. Many of them were ill, dehydrated, needed treatments of all kinds. So here, one of the hens is getting subcutaneous fluids administered. All of their nails look like this because they've only ever stood on cage flooring their entire lives. And they all had mites. And so each one was given a dust bath. And here is one, one of the 10 of the 1100 of the 3000, but really one of the billions. And that's part of my job as an animal photojournalist is to document the size of industries and how we keep billions of animals every year, but to show the individuals who we forget, you know, when we see them on our plate. Probably not a lot of you, but generally when we see them on plates and when we wear them and all this, we, you know, they resemble the farthest thing from an individual. Uh, you can see, by the way, that her beak looks a bit strange. It's because she was de-beaked. This is a common practice in industrial farming globally. They de-beak the birds so that they don't, frankly, kill one another in captivity. That's very stressful there. So they are, are there's a high mortality rate. And this is Jolene. Did I tell you her name yet? <laughs> this is Jolene. So these billions of animals, who are they and why do I photograph them? Well, this is what animal photojournalism is about. It is a genre that my organization and I coined. It's taking off. I'm really happy about that. I remember when we put together the definition of animal photojournalism, I was a bit worried. I thought, who am I to create an entire genre of photography? But it's a necessary evolution out of wildlife photography, a con continuation from conservation photography, but these things are exclusive of all animals. Animal photojournalism is inclusive of all animals beyond the pets and the wildlife. It is the animals you're meeting here tonight. And about this, um, what I said about who am I to create a whole genre of photography, but it's gone really well. Uh, we put this out into the world and I thought it might be rejected by photo editors and the photo community, but the opposite has happened. I've been invited to speak about animal photojournalism worldwide, and uh, people are calling themselves animal photojournalists too. APJ for short, it's, it's a mouthful. So these hidden animals are the animals we eat, like that pig, like this chicken raised for meat. We call them broiler chickens. The industry calls them broiler chickens. Uh, the calves who are taken away from their mothers and often raised as veal so that we can drink milk. They are the animals we wear, like this red fox. They are the animals we wear, uh, whose skins we wear. People often don't know that alligator factory farming is a thing, but here we have it. And I've photographed that in several places around the globe. They are the working animals. They are the animals caught in the ecological catastrophes unfolding right now like the Australian climate fires, where an estimated 3 billion animals died or were displaced. They are the animals caught in factory farms during tornadoes and floods. This is in North Carolina when Hurricane Florence, that point yeah, Hurricane Florence hit, uh, my team and I went to document the animals and how they were left behind because there is no infrastructure to help animals in a catastrophe like this. An estimated 5.5 million animals died. And interestingly, some of these or many of these animals were written off with insurance as inventory. When I heard that, I was just totally struck that we go so far as to call living, breathing animals inventory. And I photographed the hidden animals who are in plain view as well. And this is always very interesting. I've made a whole book called Captive about the animals who are hidden in plain view, like Kiska. This is Kiska, who you're looking at here. One of the things that I like about animal photojournalism is that, you know, we might be standing next to a bunch of people taking the exact same image, but the journalistic side of it has to come out to illuminate the story and, and really, you know, drive home what's going on, which is things that we don't see. For example, Kiska was wild caught off the coast of Iceland in 1979. She was caught with other whales who died and she was brought to Marineland and she lives 
in this uh, place, which is ironically called Friendship Cove. Ah, and she's still there. And she's in the news a whole lot. People are campaigning to get her out. And hopefully once she is out or when she passes away, uh, she will be the last there. It takes her about a minute to circumnavigate this tank. And she's been there since 1979. You can imagine. I also like this picture because people are pointing and it's such an obvious objectification of her. And this is Ron. Okay, so a chimpanzee looking at the camera. It's kind of unusual what's going on here, but it's quite incredible when, uh, when you find out. So he was a chimpanzee who was used in research for almost three decades for, for his rescue. And I photographed him at Save the Chimps. That's where you see him here. And, um, you know, I didn't know much about him until I looked into his files. I had access to all of his files and I learned that he and I were born two months apart in 1976. And I started looking at the files and thinking about the chronology of our lives. And it was just devastating, you know, to think that by the time he and I were eight, I was, you know, a kid out climbing trees, but he should have been climbing trees. But he was suspended in a cage above the ground, a five by five by seven foot cage suspended above the ground. He was anesthetized at least 105 times. And then when I was in my late teens, uh, Ron and I, well, we're, Ron and I were in our late teens. Uh, I was studying at university, but he was being studied. He was part of a spinal dynamic study in which a disc in his neck was removed. And he wasn't given pain medication for five days following that surgery. When they did give him uh, pain medication, it was two Tylenol. Like you can only imagine oh, what that was like for him. And, uh, but when Ron and I were 26, he was rescued. And this is where I, I took this picture of him where he had five acres to roam around in with other, other chimpanzees, but he always chose to stay indoors in this nest that he would make. Uh, he would make a nest of blankets and that's where he felt comfortable. And he was a very, very gentle man. And he, he died there, exactly there in fact, uh, in that nest peacefully but prematurely, which is a common fate for animals used in research. The digging deeper, the digging deeper is what we need to do because we see animals so superficially if we see them at all, like Luke the elephant here. Again, this is an example of the kind of image I would take, you know, sitting next to all the people in the audience. But what is Luke's life like? Like we have no indication from this image other than that he's a performer. But I stayed around, I stayed longer and saw what it was like for him when he was not performing. So he's chained up, he's swaying back and forth, he is alone. And on the bottom left uh, corner of that picture, there's a hose, there's a pressure hose, and he was straining against his shackles to reach it so that he'd had something to play with. And, and he did reach and he picked it up and he twirled it around and he had fun for a moment. And then his owners took it away from him and that was that. And I find it so interesting that those three women on the far right of the picture are literally ignoring the elephant in the room as we do. And so this is all really hard stuff. I, I'm aware just how hard looking at these images is, um, but more and more people are looking, it's fantastic. Uh, there was no home for this kind of work even just a few decades ago, but uh, things are changing. It's hard because uh, most of us on a superficial level or a deeper level love animals. All sorts of people say they love animals, even people who farm them industrially. So a lot of my work is about, you know, not just portraits of animals and their conditions, but of us. My project is called We Animals. It's about all of us animals. And I look at our cognitive dissonance, as in this picture, uh, which is defined as the inconsistency between one's thoughts and one's actions. Uh, he's my poster boy for this. He was, I don't know, six or seven or eight years old when he was training to be a bullfighter, a matador in Spain. I was working with animal equality when I took this picture and through, the, through them in Spanish, they asked, why do you want to be a bullfighter when you grow up? And he replied, because I love bulls. So who should have to look at all of this suffering that is so unpleasant. 
There's a book by political activist Susan Sontag, and she wrote, uh, the book is called uh, Regarding the Pain of Others. And she posits that anyone who can help should look and has a duty to look. And when it comes to the suffering of animals, that is all of us. And all of us, and I mean all of us globally, because in some way or another, um, we, are, we are involved in, in their uses and abuses. We are sharing spaces with them. And so it is our duty to look and to not turn away. That's uh, one of the mottos of We Animals Media. We're very polite here up, up here in Canada. We're, and as an organization, uh, the four words we use very often are, please don't turn away. A little bit more about me and how I how I started. This is one of my first images of an animal. And again, it was the same situation, a bunch of people standing around taking a photo. We just had different opinions about what was going on. Uh, so this is an old picture. It's not very good. It's a photo of a photo. And it's 1998. I'm in Ecuador and uh, backpacking and came across this monkey who was chained up. And people were standing around taking pictures just as I was because they thought it was cute and they thought it was funny. But I was taking pictures because I thought, well, this is, this is really painful and terrible. And maybe I can use this image as proof. Maybe I can show people. Maybe I can convince people to help the animal or change their minds. And that was one of those early moments for me when I knew I wanted to be a photographer, but I didn't know where I was going. I knew I wanted to help others. I didn't know I was going to be helping animals. But it was definitely one of those aha moments for me. And there are, there are photos, as you know, this one, Napalm Girl by Nick Oot. Uh, this image won a Pulitzer Prize. And I, lo I love photography because it has such instantaneous power, the power to bring things that are impersonal into our living rooms and into our hands. You know, this was on TV and in the newspaper. And it changed the conversation about the Vietnam War. This image is a, is a household image, and we've seen that throughout history. And let's go back a lot farther when, when photography had really just begun and just created. This is an image of Gordon. He was a runaway slave, and it was a portrait that was taken showing the very real physical effects of slavery on Black people. And it was one of the first images that was published nationwide in the U.S., and it galvanized people and it created a conversation. And this image became historic. One of the historic images of what slavery looked like. And fundamentally, or eventually, it was an image that helped with abolition in 1865. And that is what conflict photographers are trying to do. We are trying to change the course of history. That is what I'm trying to do as an animal photojournalist. And so I, I took my project, We Animals, and we turned it into a photo agency, We Animals Media. We turned it into a stock site. We have thousands of images that are available for anyone helping animals to use. And we also created this book, which is a calling card for animal photojournalism. I wanted to make a book because, because that's what people do when things are important, isn't it? Like we don't want these important poignant images just zooming by on social media. We wanna say that this needs and deserves a historic place in society. And um, I was influenced by the conflict photographers who were making books about war, showing what is and should never again be. And so we made a five pound, many hundreds of pages book that is unflinching of our uses and abuses of animals. Again, I thought that this was, you know, I was taking a chance and that no one was going to look at this book, but the book is doing very, very, very well. We, I think it's the next slide. Yes, it, it received Photography uh, Book of the Year by Picture of the Year International. It was co-edited by Keith Wilson and I. It's not just my work, which is also exciting. It's the work of 40 photographers and, and writers. So here it is. This is the cover. I'm going to read you a little excerpt from it later. But it covers what we cover, what we animal photojournalists cover. People need to know how animals are slaughtered. People don't know that male chicks are ground up and used as fertilizer because male chicks don't lay eggs. People don't know how foie gras is produced. This is a goose, a goose being force fed so that we can eat their fatty liver. Wet markets. I mean, we all learned what wet markets were because of this pandemic. 
And, uh, but what do these places look like and how are animals treated? And what happens when there are zoonotic outbreaks, uh, diseases that jump from animals to the humans? Well, what we do is we kill those animals by the millions and millions. This all happens out of sight and out of mind. And that's because it looks like this. This, um, well, by the way, we're getting into not just my images, I just wanna be clear about that. We're getting into the images of our many contributors. Uh, this is in South Korea. What you're seeing, that box at the bottom, they're rounding up those ducks and they're dropping them into the ground alive, and then they're going to cover them up. And that's it. That is how, that is how we treat others. This is a few decades ago when there was an outbreak of foot and mouth disease in the UK. They had to kill millions of animals. Uh, we look at how animals are used culturally around the world. And again, animals in plain view, animals used in entertainment. And I really, really appreciate this image by Ator Garmendia. He's one of the best APJs of our time. I like it because it just says everything. <laughs> it's like it shows how wrong this is. Like, you know, this animal should not be there. This animal could not be any farther from home. And I like that it protects the identity of the children as well. You will see workers in our work. You will see all sorts of people but the point is not to call out the people. The point is to call out practices. It's about calling out industries. We kept the writing to a minimal. Uh, in the book, we kept it very factual. And the facts are, are staggering. We generally have no idea uh, the billions and the trillions. Yes. And then the book ends with, uh, with this image. It's, uh, it speaks for itself, doesn't it? I mean, we all probably want to shout out what it reminds us of, but, it, but we don't need to. Okay, I'm gonna read you just this very, very short, short bit from the book. And there's a photo of a, of a man. Club. Do I wanna show you that? I'm not gonna show it to you. There's a really difficult image of a man clubbing a pig. And uh, it's quite, quite painful. I didn't want to put another image next to it because the image really stand on, stands on its own. And I didn't want to write text that talked about the image. Again, it stands on its own. It speaks for itself. And so I spent days, I spent a couple of quiet days thinking about what, what do I want to say? What do I want to put next to this? And I turned to my Buddhist studies. Uh, there is a, a Buddhist scholar and philosopher named Shanti Deva. He lived and wrote in the eighth century. And he has this prayer and it's a very famous prayer. And I accompany this image with this prayer. It's very short and I'd like to read it to you. And I will say that it's about all of the animals in the book, human and non-human. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, and for as long as sentient beings remain, until then, may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. I also wanted to include that because that's how I feel. That's my mission. As long as I remain, I will be here to help dispel the miseries of the world. Now, all of this is very paralyzing, I realize. So with We Animals Media, we do, believe it or not, like to balance the good with the bad, balance the bad with the good rather. And same with this book, we created an insert and it's a beautiful 11 by 17 fold out and it's called The Way Forward. And so we, as you can see, list all sorts of things that we can do to make the world a kinder place for others. We also have solutionary projects. There's a term some of you know. <laughs> we have solutionary projects at We Animals as well, which I'm going to get into now. It is not all doom and gloom. That paralyzes me as well. Um, I was diagnosed with PTSD after doing so much of this investigative work. And I, I wasn't balancing the good with the bad, bad with the good. I remember waking up one morning about a decade ago, and the first thought in my head was a, a sow in a gestation crate. And I thought, okay, <laughs> this isn't good. I need some therapy. I have this one short life to live, and I want to have a really happy life. So I'm going to refocus on hope and on being happy. And uh, because that's, that's how I wanna live in this, on this one short life that I have. I have learned to live 
parallel to all of the suffering of the world, not totally enmeshed in it as I, as I used to do, because that leads to burnout and animals need us to all be around for as long as we possibly can, because there are so few people working on behalf of animals. So we need to take care of ourselves. So a few happy stories, probably a whole bunch of happy stories now, actually. Uh, this is Pekin on the right and Apollinaire is holding her. She was rescued from the bushmeat trade in Cameroon. And you should never get in a car with a gorilla. Uh, you could end up in big trouble, but luckily she was sedated. Uh, she was sedated because she had just left the veterinarians. Um, she was sedated for a health check before being moved to a larger enclosure with her fellow gorillas. We got in the car. She was sleeping. She woke up, made me really nervous. Uh, I managed to get some award-winning pictures. And uh, because she was in the arms of her beloved friend, Apollinaire, she felt comfortable. She looked around a little bit and she went back to sleep. Thank goodness. And this is Susie and Jay at Farm Sanctuary. Jay was the only steer who lived a transport crash. I uh, caught fire, he ran into the forest. He himself was on fire, but he did survive. And then, interestingly, his story became one of like, oh, you know, it's wonderful, one survived, and everyone cheered for that. And it's just so interesting considering how many, how many of us would have also been happy eating him had he not survived the, the, the crash. And I love this photo because it, it shows the kind of relationships we can have with, you know, domesticated animals. So often we only interact with them when they're on our plate, but uh, just beautiful, loving animals with. Uh, their own diverse personalities like these guys. These are cotton top tamarins. They are among the world's smallest primates. Uh, they have been rescued from research. They are now at Jungle Friends Sanctuary. And I'd find this picture so cute. They're just starting to leave cages and explore the outdoors. They have a lot of space to roam around in. And, and it just looks like they're sort of caught in the act, which I find so adorable. Like I'm kind of disturbing them. <laughs> and this is Pepsi. He was also rescued from, from research uh, in New Mexico, where he lived several decades. And he's unique, not only for those golden eyes, but because he has a foot fetish. They are unique, just like we are. And um, I was being toured around Save the Chimps, and he saw me. And he started motioning to my feet and like hooting and hollering and motioning to my feet. And Dr. Carol Noon, who rescued him, said, Oh, show him your feet. He, you know, he likes seeing feet and you're the new girl. He hasn't seen your feet yet. And, uh, you know, we do what we can for them around here, which is so funny. So I took off my shoes and showed him my feet. He was very impressed. <laughs> yeah, you know, everywhere I go, I photograph the bad, but I also get to photograph the helpers. As Fred Rogers said, you know, find the helpers, look for the helpers. They're everywhere. And uh, here is a veterinarian giving care to a koala who was injured in the bushfires. And it just broke my heart to, to know that she had been orphaned and that it's typical for veterinarians to give a teddy bear to koalas for comfort. And as you can see, she's just clinging to that, that teddy bear. It broke my heart. I do have a penchant for bears. This is a Malayan sun bear, and he was rescued from bear bile farming. His name is Arte. He lives in Vietnam. And one of the many adorable things about uh, all bears is that you will often see them using the tops of their paws as plates, which is what you're seeing Arte do here. He's eating a snack and resting it there on the top of his paw. So bear bile farming. Why do bears need rescuing and what, what are bear bile farms? Uh, they live in conditions like this and worse, still tens of thousands of them do in Southeast Asia and, and China as well. Their gallbladders are tapped for bile, which is used in traditional Chinese medicine. That it, it does have therapeutic effects, but we can, there are all sorts of other things we can use, right? Like uh, anti-inflammatories, we don't need to use bear bile. And so this is an industry that is on its demise. And um, this is a bear bile farm. I snuck into this place in Southeast Asia, in Laos. And this is the rescue of a bear uh, who was named Miracle. This is her arrival at Tam Dao Sanctuary in Vietnam. What I like about this picture is that you see where she spent her whole life in that miserable, awful cage that she can't even stand up straight in. She was put into the tiny door on the bottom left as a cub, and then they closed the door and that was it. 
they used her body for eight years before this rescue. And so you see where she lived, but you see where she is going to spend the rest of her life, which is that incredible sanctuary space in the background. So they had to sedate her and pry apart the bars to get her out. Those things on her head are calluses from rubbing her head back and forth against the bars for years and years. That's why her ears are callous. Her paws are in just absolutely terrible condition. But it was wonderful to see all of these people lovingly take her out and bring her to the operating room where she had an ultrasound. She had teeth removed. They did all sorts of things to pre prepare her for a happier life. Her paws are in terrible condition. That's a bar mark along her heel there. And her feet are just so cracked and her nails are long, but they took good care of her. And I was able to go back to Tamdao Sanctuary three years later, and this is her. She is doing so well. And I got to photograph her playing and eating brows. And one of the staff said, uh, she's a really funny one. They said she eats the most, she has the most friends and she stays out the longest. <laughs> And so unfortunately, these animals can't be rewilded. Of course they can't because they've always been in captivity. So sanctuary spaces, just wonderful spaces that give animals as much autonomy as they possibly can while they're living out the rest of their lives. Uh, I don't know this bear's name, but I do know a little bit about his story. And I took this photo of him in Cambodia. He looks like he's depressed and in, cap and in captivity, but he's not in the captivity he came from. Uh, he's at a sanctuary by Free the Bears. Sorry if I ever said that already. And um, he was kept in a bear bar farm in what they call a crush cage. You can imagine what that is for four years before his rescue. He had started producing lower quality bile. And so they were going to kill him. But before they did that, they cut off his front paws for bear paw soup, which is still incredibly a delicacy in some places in Southeast Asia. But he survived that. They cauterized his limbs and he survived that. So here is this poor bear. He's been rescued though, thank goodness. And, uh, and he's got, you know, these stumps and uh, he has a whole sanctuary space like Ron did. Ron, the chimpanzee, had uh, all this space to roam around in with the other chimpanzees. But uh, like Ron, this bear preferred to stay indoors and he wanted to be near people. Who knows why? And I started taking pictures of him, as you see here. And he's giving me this look. And one of the caretakers said, oh, don't mind him. He's looking depressed, but he's just, that's his begging face. He's begging for his favorite treat, which is pineapple jam. I got this close to him and was taking the pictures and he reached through the bars very quickly and he grabbed me and he pulled me against the bars and he could have bitten me. He could have broken my ribs. These are very strong animals, but he didn't. He was just being playful. And in that moment, I was in this bear hug, but I was being held by his stumps and he released me. And I looked at him again in wonder. And he's just one of those animals, one of the many that I've met who, you know, remind me about forgiveness and remind me of just how much we've put them through and how much we owe them. And so there are a lot of these animals, Ron and this bear and the chickens and the fish, so many who I've met who remind me every single day that there's a lot of work ahead. In my travels, everywhere I went, I saw women on the front lines of animal advocacy. And I wondered, am I just seeing that because I'm a feminist? Am I just seeing that because that's what I want to see? And so I did some research and it turns out that the animal welfare movement is made up 60 to 80 percent women and yet at least when i started this project okay still so, um men were often at the head of an organization they were the visible person they were you know uh, the people doing interviews and getting called the executive director and the president and all this so i decided to do this project unbound this is you know i think we're in year seven now celebrating women's uh, pioneering work and not just their pioneering work, even the day-to-day -day stuff. To date, I think we featured over 70 women around the world, and I'd like to introduce you to some of them, like Cora Bailey, who is the founder of Community-Led Animal Welfare in South Africa. So she is in the Ranfontein dump. Uh, walking ahead of her is her son, Moses, who helps her in this work. 
you know, she brought me there and she told me afterwards that uh, no one goes there, not even the police, because it's so dangerous. But she's very welcome there because she helps their animals. And uh, it was a real privilege to be there with her and to meet the people who live there. So hundreds of people live in this dump. So there we were, you know, she's found a puppy that needs attention. She's found, so people farm animals there as well. And here is a, a piglet. He's the runt of the litter and he's dying. And so she asked the owners of the pig if she could have the pig. And they agreed to that. Here is Moses, Moses picking up uh, and bringing to the truck one of the very, very ill animals who are in pain. This is not an ill or injured animal. This is just a lazy animal. <laughs> this was uh, on a different day where they were doing vet checks and, and vaccinations. And so Moses and the staff were there with the mobile unit truck and they were picking up dogs <laughs> to bring them for a checkup. And the kids who live there were really proud as well to be taking care of their animals and, and you know, proudly bringing them to the, the mobile vet unit to, to get them checked out. It was really quite an experience. Uh, we left that day with that piglet. Uh, this is a selfie. And uh, we really were not sure that that pig was going to make it. Spot the pig. <laughs> Spot the very, very tiny little pig. So this is a few days later. Uh, she had recovered and she now lives at this sanctuary where you see her with dogs and all sorts of farmed animals. And uh, she's like a 500 pound pig now. She's, she's massive. Her name is Whammy. She's doing very, very well. It's, you know, it's such a balm for my soul to meet all of these incredible people, shelter staff and first responders like Lumpe Golintete. Like she is one of these people who works her ass off behind the scenes. She gets those emergency calls at three in the morning and she gets in a uh, mobile unit and goes to where there are problems. And I get to photograph sanctuary founders like Carrie Bagnell. She's the founder of Jungle Friends, Primate Sanctuary. So sanctuary owners, frontline workers, plant-based and cultivated meat pioneers. Do you remember a couple decades ago, like vegan food didn't look like this. <laughs> and now it's fantastic. Some of you may know Miyoko Shinner. She is the founder of Miyoko's Cheese. I got to photograph her for the Unbound Project recently. She is getting like millions and millions and millions of dollars in investments into her amazing company, which is making vegan cheese. And she runs a sanctuary too. Like how incredible is that? So the last picture that's at her sanctuary and here she is in one of the cold rooms at the cheese factory. I get to photograph politicians like Marianne Time. She is the founder of the Dutch Party for Animals. And Holland is one of these very progressive countries who has uh, made great advances on banning the import of trophy hunts. The goal of the party is ultimately to ban factory farming. They are working on all sorts of initiatives that there's no longer animals performing in circuses. They had banned fur farming. I think that fell to the side and I think it's happening again. Amazing people. So I would be remiss to not shout out Zo Wiles. It was wonderful to feature Zo in the Unbound Project because she's an absolute visionary in education. She's co-founder of the Institute for Humane Education, who is one of our hosts tonight. Liberationists like Patty Mark. So here is a woman who has been liberating animals and going to jail for it for decades. And she stays with it because it helps publicize, you know, that these animals are worthy of being removed from these terrible places. Innovative veterinarians like Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikazoka. So here's an incredible woman who wanted to, so the gorillas in Uganda were getting these human-born illnesses. And so if you want to help the gorillas, which she wanted to do, you have to help the neighboring communities who are also you know, battling poverty and illness and lack of sanitation. And so if you want to help animals, you have to help all animals. I love how inclusive her work is. She's an absolute pioneer and an inspiration. I get to photograph women entering the growing field of animal rights law. Women who take leaps of faith like Rabia Hawa. Rabia was the first female Muslim park ranger in Kenya. And women in science, like neurologist Aisha Akhtar, who specializes in preventative medicine and public health. So all of her work is centered around getting animals out of labs and changing laws and changing hearts and minds and changing medicine. It's pretty incredible. And lastly, Dr. Theodora Capaldo. 
She was the president of the New England Anti-Vivisection Society for many decades. I love this quote by her. It's all the same, really. Environment, women, children, civil rights, the animals. It's all about the same thing, compassion and doing what's right for everyone. And it was really special to be able to photograph her with a rat because, of course, she had advocated and continues to advocate for rats who are used in research. And so I get to see a lot of good in the world. I get to see a lot of change in the world. And I get to see our changing ideas and philosophies as well. We're learning to avoid tourism that involves the use and abuse of animals. We're seeing humane education in schools globally now. This is in South Africa. So the Black Mambas uh, are an all-female anti-poaching unit, but they are also in schools when they're not being rangers, um, getting kids to care about, care about animals. We're speaking at our political representatives. This was in Toronto when a bunch of ordinary citizens took time out of their day to come to City Hall and to have their five minutes to speak up about how they felt it was important to to bring on a ban on the import of shark fin products. We're supporting sanctuary, rescue, and conservation efforts instead of zoos and aquaria. And hopefully in my lifetime, I'm aiming for it. I know most of you are as well. I know many of you are working on the same things that I'm working on. We will see a closure of all unaccredited roadside zoos. We will see an end to puppy mills. This was a confiscation of puppies uh, by the Humane Society International and the Montreal SPCA. I think it was 110 animals who were rescued that day and that farm closed down. We will see an end to trophy hunting. We will see a global ban on fur farming. It's now being proposed in Canada, a national ban. We're seeing bans on the production of fur in many countries now. Norway, many countries in Europe, you know, there's just so many efforts now for it to no longer be in fashion and for people to understand or, you know, the innate cruelty that, that is there. So what you're seeing here is a, a former fur farm. So these cages used to hold boxes, but as a result of the, the work that I did, the investigative work uh, at this farm, created images that were then presented as a dossier to the Montreal SPCA. They were able to get a warrant, to investigate the place and confiscate all of the animals. So this is one of my favorite things about animal photojournalism, of course, is that we get to be part of the change. We get to help campaigners. We get to help um, with policy and, and confiscations and so on. I think that soon we will see an end to the humiliation of animals in circuses. This photo was taken in France and uh, the use of wild animals in circuses has been banned since I took this picture. Not because of, but you know, part of the efforts. And I think we will continue to see a ban on the captive breeding and keeping of cetaceans. We will see an end to the use of animals in cosmetic testing. Probably medical testing is a longer road, but in cosmetic testing for sure. Now, what you're seeing here is a farmer holding what he said was his product. Yes, his product. Uh, these are animals who are shipped globally to be used for entertainment and in, in research. A lot of these animals are wild caught. They're also bred at these facilities. But as a result of the investigative work that my team and I did, uh, this work was presented at the CITES convention in Geneva the following year. And as a result, two of the three farms were closed down. This is Joyce Tischler. Uh, what a funny image to, to end on. She's known as the mother of animal law. And it was 1979 where she decided that she was gonna make animal law a thing and it needed to happen. And uh, it wasn't a thing that no one was doing it. And now, as we know, animal law is thriving. A lot of people are being drawn to it. You know, she didn't know where she would end up today, but she is tenacious as heck. And she's an absolute role model for me. And uh, I love this celebratory picture of her, which I took for the Unbound Project. I end on a couple of these happy images because I, I want us to remember to celebrate the good and celebrate the change and, and focus on that and do what we can every single day. Sometimes we can do a little bit and sometimes we can do a lot. Last story. I, I got to meet some chimpanzees who were used in behavioral research and they, um, they were taught sign language and I had never in my life, been able to communicate with a common language. 
with an animal. Uh, we communicate with our dogs and cats, you know, verbally to an extent, but, you know, we get to know their body language and we get to know them a bit. But generally, when we are facing animals and they're facing us, there's just this divide, isn't there? We stare at one another, but we don't know what the other is thinking. And so often, because they cannot speak in our language, we assume the worst, don't we? Historically, we've done so. We've treated them terribly as a result. And here I was meeting a chimpanzee who could sign. And next to me was my friend, Carl, and he was holding a Tim Hortons cup of coffee and the chimpanzee signed to us through a translator, rather the translator translated for us. Uh, the chimpanzee signed, is that coffee? And we were just amazed that, you know, this individual was, was thinking about that and could ask a question. And we replied, yes. And then the chimpanzee asked if they could have the coffee with milk. <laughs> it was just one of those many moments that I've had, you know, those big moments of realization that there's someone so intelligent and complex and thoughtful and curious and sentient. And, but they're all like that, you know, these chimpanzees got to express that because they were taught sign language from us, but like all animals are having opinions about everything, just like we are. And it is, is such a shame that that is not our default assumption. And I want it to be. That's why I tell these stories. That's why I tell these stories about what I've seen of their behaviors in the world. It's because I want us to know that there's someone rich and wonderful in there and deserving of the respect that we afford other humans, not always, but like they, you know, when it comes to sentience, I just put us all on the same level you know if we are sentient we deserve to be treated with dignity and we deserve to live free of harm so i will always assume that there is someone interesting in there who um, deserves protecting that's what animal photojournalism is for it's because people who are taking photos of these animals believe their stories need to be told and shared so that people will look and think and change and and not turn away and with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for being with me this evening and, and hearing about these animals I've met over these 20 years. And I'm very grateful to you for looking and for seeing and for not turning away. And there are some websites down there if you want to check out uh, the work that we do, We Animals Media and the Unbound Project. And I do want you all to know that you're welcome to use the thousands of images that are there. We have over 65 contributors now, so it's not just my work, it's the work of many people. And you can use those images for your campaigning for anything you need. And we'll go back to Nandita. Hello. Hi, Joe. That was incredible. I, yeah, I've watched your presentations a number of times and every time I come away weeping. Thank you so much for that. I'm so happy that you're doing this work. Uh, not only are you an amazing photojournalist, you are a great storyteller. Yeah, There's you. a lot of love in the chat. That was really incredible. Such a combination of heartbreak, but also really inspiring stories of success. And yeah, I want to launch right into questions. People are dying to ask you questions. But the first one that I wanted to ask, and a really obvious one that you already touched on, is this is really difficult work heart-wrenching at times, and you even mentioned that you have suffered from PTSD. How do you balance your one-pointed dedication to animal protection, but also the trauma and fatigue that this work entails? Mm, well, people who are involved in animal protection know that it's an uphill battle, but that things are changing, and we're seeing it on so many fronts. And so I choose to live there. Like I said, I don't I no longer live in the pain every day. I live alongside it and I focus on what I can do. And sometimes that's a little and sometimes that's a lot, but I have a huge community of people who are doing it as well. And I try and be careful with my energy and how I use it and where I use it. That's something we all need to do, isn't it? And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and I also um, really enjoy meditation and finding the calm that comes with that. Uh, for, for people who are also you know, here and suffering because of what you know and what you've seen. It's 
good to just acknowledge it. And I know that there's not a lot of support for us, though that's changing. You know, oh, you care about animals, you're just sentimental and that, but there's a big community to tap into. And there are great books too, like Melanie Joy is a fantastic resource. Uh, in terms of self-care. And there's a fantastic book called Aftershock by Patrice Jones, published by Lantern Media. And for me, it was when I started out, it was my Bible of self-care because the book is written specifically for people in animal advocacy and how to deal with the violence of the world. Probably the Institute for Humane Education has a number of resources as well. You do, yes. And I'll uh, go to the next question. It's very relevant to what you just said. Do you think that refusing to look at most cruel images can limit the power for change of animal rights advocates? I know you've spoken about balance. Mm. In some ways, you kind of need to lean into it. And in other ways, you also, you said you walk a parallel path. So you're not so enmeshed in it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's personal. And some people feel... Uh, a responsibility to bear witness often and to look at the suffering of others because they're going through it. The least we can do is look at it. For me, like it's a educational point. It's, you know, I want people to look at the images and become sensitized and like get educated about what others go through, but I'm not of the camp that we need to look at it all the time because it's so painful and we're at risk of just living in that pain. You know, this is difficult because I don't want to give like wrong advice it's, it's different for, for everybody. Um, you know, some people will look at an image of slaughter and stop eating animals and, and become an activist. Most people will just shut down. So I think we have to use images very carefully, be friendly. I think activists have a very bad reputation for, <laughs> for talking about the, the issues that we care about uh, because we're seen as dogmatic or, or pushy and all this. Um, I mean, we have right to be pushy. This is an emergency on planet Earth for billions of animals every single day. But um, I think if we want to be effective communicators, we need to pick the images wisely, pick the stories wisely, pick the information and, and know your audience. Uh, there's definitely a place for the difficult images. There are many places for the difficult images, but there's also a lot of opportunity to use the, the really positive images as well. You know, part of the Unbound project is that people can look up to these incredible people and say like, here's a positive image of someone running a sanctuary or in science or in animal law. And they might feel inspired that way to make changes. So yeah, I think you need many tools in your toolbox. That's great advice. We have another one from Simon. Uh, Joanne, thank you so much for your valuable work. What's your view of pets? I grew up with a beautiful dog, but now I cannot bring myself to deprive a pet of natural social and sexual relations with its own kind, particularly a pack animal like a dog. Wow, what a great question. I don't think any of us, and I think you know this as well, we shouldn't be buying animals because that just perpetuates the breeding of them and you know, creating animals who have a lack of autonomy. And as you say, we want the animals in our lives to, to have as much autonomy as, as possible and be able to pick their families and pick when they go outside and pick the food and um, pick the food they want to eat. And it's just really hard to do when we have animals living in our homes in the society. And yet, if you are rescuing a shelter animal, then you are giving them a second chance at life. And it may not be the perfect life, but it's probably, probably going to be pretty good with you if you're, you know, someone who's that considerate, which clearly you are. And also like, what are the untold joys that you or your family members get from, you know, being enriched by sharing a life with someone who really wants a life and who doesn't want to be in those shelters. So mm, I'll leave it at that. That's great. Thank you. Uh, the next one's a more of a personal question, Joe, and it surrounds a lot of the work that we do at Population Balance, Fair Start Movement, Institute for Humane Education, is we're really trying to connect a lot of the social justice movements together so we can find overlapping values and actually work for a larger goal. And in this one, I would like to talk about our decision to have children. Having kids is seen as a very personal and isolated decision, but we don't have to use too much of an imagination to realize that it's actually an interpersonal decision. It has incredible implications on 
um, our potential children, the planet, people, uh, et cetera. And early on, you made the decision to not have kids. I'd love to know what your thinking was and your journey to get, get along that path. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I was so happy for this invite, because I love talking about my choice and it's, you know, people are so touchy about it. When I tell people, which is not that often that I had a tubal ligation when I was 31 or so, people just want to run to defend their choices, which is what we see in animal rights and veganism too, isn't it? It just, it's a choice that made so much sense for me. And the reason I came to it is that, you know, in my teens and in my, in my twenties, I was planning on having kids because that's what people did. And I wasn't thinking critically. I thought, you know, I, I was thinking about the model, the social model of marriage and kids. I wasn't really thinking about my wants. I just assumed that I would want it. You know, people talk about the biological clock kicking in and, um, you know, as I got older, I was like, my life is amazing. There's no biological clock happening for me. And also on top of that, I care so much about how humans are treating others. And I mean the animals and I mean the environment. And the more people we create, you know, the more trouble there's going to be because our footprint is absolutely incredible, especially for someone like me in Canada. We use an insane amount of resources. And so I start thinking like, is it possible for me to not have kids? Like, what's that going to be like? And like, what are people going to think of me? And people who are, are child-free by choice know that you get all sorts of comments. Like, we don't know what love is. You know, we'll never know happiness. Like, well, you'll never know my incredible life. I live happily and in service. And I have all this beautiful time that I know time with children is beautiful, but I also have beautiful time to learn and explore and do good in the world and fulfill my missions. And so I really love being able to talk about this choice that I made and show that I have an incredible life and that if I do want kids, you know, if one day I wake up and I'm like, I would like a child in my life. Well, there are so many children who need homes and care and fostering and adoption. And that fits very, very much with my worldview. And that is the route that I would take. So I love what your organization is doing. I support you wholeheartedly. And I'm glad that you, you know, are asking me these questions because it gives me an opportunity to, to say like, yes, like I am one of these people who I made a different choice in life. I'm so happy about it. It just feels to my core that it's the right thing for every reason. That was magical. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saying all of that. Those are such, uh, such a great answer. And to add to some of the um, misconceptions out there, one of the things we hear, especially what Pope Francis said recently, is not having children and keeping companion animals is selfish. And I would say you probably are one of the most selfless people out there doing incredible work for animals and for people. Yeah, it's just not a very con well considered comment. Uh, it's a very narrow anthropocentric comment, uh, but the world is changing and there are many ways to love and there are many ways to be in the world. And we have to reimagine our ways of being in the world because there are too many of us. We are, because we are using too many resources. Um, that's not going to change quickly enough to turn this thing around. And so one of the ways that we can help save the earth is to not have big families, and make different choices and see, like reimagine it. This is the, this is the beauty of humans. Like we have an incredible imagination to, to build and to redo things and rethink things and change cultures. Culture by definition is in flux, right? Like cultures change, traditions are slower to change, but but they can. And so let's do it. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes, There's going to be so much pushback, but <laughs> no. maybe not from people here, but. <laughs> and, and that's why we're bringing the different social justice movements together is to, to help, you know, I, I'm an animal rights activist, but I left the movement to go into the sustainable population movement because I know that this is way more upstream than just diet changes really our problem is existential for for animals and for the planet so yeah thank you for being such a great role model 
We have a lot of questions, so I'll ask one or two really quick ones. Have any of your images changed a situation for the better, uh, or even in terms of leading to policy change? Okay, thank you for asking that. That is the reason we have all of our work available for free to people helping animals. And our strategy now at We Animals Media is to partner with organizations who are campaigning. So people often assume that WAM, it's a great acronym, We Animals Media, that WAM is a campaigning organization, but we're not. We're creating materials for campaigners. And so exactly what we want is for people to use them to inform public opinion, policy change, proof. Well, for example, in my presentation, I, I noted that those images that we shot at the macaque breeding facility, they were brought to the CITES convention in Geneva and two of those farms were closed. Our work helps close fur farms and it know, helps on many, many levels. And that's exactly what we want. Quite often the campaigners use our images to then go to the government and, and demand change or create petitions and enliven public discourse to get more and more people on board. So the point is exactly to affect real world, world change. And while that, that does take time, that is, that is our goal. So some of you might be with NGOs out there that we can work with. We're currently continuing to build relationships with NGOs globally. And we have 65 or so contributors now. So it used to be just me out in the world photographing, but now we have people stationed everywhere and we can give assignments and say, okay, well, we're hiring you to, to shoot this. And we're able to do this because of donations and grants. People often ask like, how, like, am I a self-made millionaire or something? Like who's funding this? But we're a not-for-profit. We're supported by donors, monthly donors, $5 a month, $100 a month, and big grants that allow us to give assignments to photographers and disseminate this work for free out into the world. Awesome. A uh, couple of comments from people about humane educational resources for elementary and middle schools. Is that something your organization is working on? I know the Institute for Humane Education provides a lot of free resources. So they're the go-to here. For me personally, I do speak with people of all ages about being compassionate and animal stories. And so part of my job is to speak globally, virtually and in person. Anyone is welcome to reach out to me if you'd like me to come speak to your school or your university, your program. But yes, back to the IHE. That's where the resources are. Okay, so another question how does your documenting animals change when we move from a vision of ending animal suffering towards a vision of animal liberation as the restoration of biodiverse non-human communities? Is there a way to visually connect this vision of liberty to the restorative family planning models that would get us there? I think that animal advocates can do, myself included, a much better job at creating the, the links that we need to see. We treat our advocacy as though it's quite siloed, right? Especially animal rights, but animal rights overlaps with major population issues. It overlaps with human rights, essentially, and environmental uh, problems and racism and sexism. And once we see that these things do overlap, and if you're helping one, then you're helping the other, we're going to get so much farther ahead. For example, when I'm at slaughterhouses and factory farms where people are working, these are generally not places that people want to work. And maybe in animal advocacy, we would be so quick to vilify these people for having violent jobs that they don't want those jobs. Like there are a few situations here. We have to, you know, abolish slaughterhouses because they're terrible places for animals. We have to abolish them because they're terrible places for humans and for the environmental issues that are caused from all the killing. So the more that we see the overlap, the better things will be. Thank you for addressing that one. And uh, one last question we'll take for the night. So while you were speaking about the boy training to be a matador in Spain, you mentioned a book about animals by a female author. Can you please reshare the name of that book? It's an easy yes, one. Yes, yes. So her name is Susan Sontag. And I love her because... Uh, she writes about sociology and politics, but she also writes about photography. She's like a photography ethicist and philosopher, you could say. So Susan Sontag, and the book is called Regarding the Pain of Others. 
And uh, if you're really into photography, you can read her book called On Photography. It's quite famous. Wonderful. I think that is pretty good for tonight. Joanne, thank you so much for such an incredible talk. Clearly, there's a lot of interest in these intersectional issues. And this is really why we are running events like this, is to make it all come together. Thank you for bringing it to life for us. And thanks to our really engaged audience and for all the yeah. incredible questions you all asked. What a great event. And with that, we're going to close it off for the night and say a big thank you to Joe and to everyone else. Thanks for the honor of the invite. And thanks everyone for coming. <laughs>